Okay, so it looks like we are live now. Okay. Uh, good morning to anyone. Good morning to everyone who might be joining us today. Uh, I am here with my friend Peter. Uh, my friend Peter, uh, I've had the opportunity of getting to know and spending some time with, especially um, last uh, summer as I was getting ready to go to Rwanda for the summer. I was looking for some information, having never been to Rwanda before. I've spent time in Kenya. I've spent time in Uganda, but I've never been able to. Uh, I had not ever been to Rwanda, and I reached out to Peter, and uh, I was able to spend a little bit of time with him and get to know him and his family, and it was so helpful to just get some cultural background at a place I've never been before. Similarly, um, as we got to know Peter, uh, we started talking about, you know, the biggest the biggest issue that people think about or hear about when you think about Rwanda. Many people have seen or know about the movie Hotel Rwanda and about the genocide that happened there. Uh, but uh, it's very rare, you know, these are things that you see on movies, you see on documentaries, but a lot of times the idea that you would meet someone or hear from someone who personally experienced it is not something that everyone has the opportunity to. So I just wanted to bring my friend Peter uh, to be able to share a little bit about his stories, what that was like. I guess that was 26 years ago. Uh, Peter also is involved in nonprofit work with the church here in the Houston area, and I think uh, has even not just speaks about that genocide that happened 26 years ago, but actually even bringing awareness about some of the needs of Rwanda today with the coronavirus. So Peter, why don't you just uh, introduce yourself just a little bit, tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe talk about your current work in Rwanda with the coronavirus, how it's impacting people there, and then we can transition to talking about genocide. Yeah, thank you, uh, friend. Um, yeah, so my name is Peter, and I'm here in uh, Kingwood, uh, Texas, and um, uh, we have uh, uh, been very much connected in Rwanda, not only that is my country, uh, for, uh, you know, seven years plus living in America. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was uh, able to talk to my brother and my sister-in-law who live in Rwanda, and uh, they told me about um, many families, especially those with the children who are starving because coronavirus in Africa, especially you know in the third world of the countries, they don't have all these uh, social benefits like we do have here in America, and so uh, they don't have you know things like uh, food stamps, uh, you know stimulus checks, and uh, you know, food pantries, all kind of stuff, they are not there. And so they told me that the families were starving and that touched my heart. And uh, so our church is very small. We just launched our church a few, uh, you know, like when the coronavirus hit, uh, we had just met uh, officially four times. And, uh, but we gathered uh, some money and we were able to provide food uh, to 149 people and, uh, you know, the food they can uh, live on for about a week. And, uh, you know, because people were just in the fight, in, you know, in the homes and, uh, you know, in, in, they can't go to work. And, you know, most people live on the money they make every day. It's like many people don't have these uh, monthly salaries and uh, others have a small businesses and everything was shut down so but uh, these families were very thankful and uh we are actually raising the money uh you know each family you can feed a family for 30 dollars you know um and that's what i've been doing and uh, uh in fact yesterday i sent more money uh, we hope to feed at least 160 families, I mean, 160 people this week, and we're going to be sending more money. The more we get, the more we keep sending. I feel that that's what we're going to be doing. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, I interviewed yesterday my friend Eliakim, who's in Kenya, Western province in Kenya, 
Mm-hmm. He was saying how the police are even using like tear gas to break up people trying to go to the market. You know, the police might hit people with batons if they're out on the streets at past curfew. And so here in the United States, uh, some of us can work from home. Some of us can get on our computers. You know, as a teacher, that's what I'm actually having to do, teaching from home. Yeah. And uh, But there's a lot of people in these countries where, you know, their job is to go physically to market, to go and sell things. And as soon as there is a government mandated shutdown, that's their livelihood. If your job is to be a ditch digger, you know, if you dig ditches, all that is, is interrupted. Yes. So I've been really impressed with like uh, how much can go so far, you know, like the numbers you were telling me, I know in Kenya it's similar that $30 can feed a family of five or six for a week to buy some mm-hmm. flour, yeah. buy some, you know, oil, uh, sugar, you know, things like that. So that's super great. I'm really excited to hear that uh, you guys are able to do that. And maybe at the end I'll get a link and I'll put it in the comments so that if people want to give uh, to the Rwanda families you're supporting, they'll be able to click on that link and check it out. Yeah, so, yeah, that'd be great. Okay, cool. So, uh that's what you guys are active now. But um, 26 years ago, I guess it is, you know, this uh, month of April is a month of remembrance and particularly in Rwanda, but the, you know, everyone from Rwanda who's moved to Canada, the United States, all around the world, people remember, especially in the month of April, uh, about what happened 26 years ago. And Americans have some knowledge, but the farther it comes away from it, the less it seems Americans know about genocide. So Peter, uh, we've had you come to our high school physically last year, and of course with the coronavirus it's impossible this year, but maybe you could just tell us a little bit about how did how did genocide, how did you play into that, how old were you, uh, how did you experience that? Well, um it was a uh, very horrible. Uh, I was a 14 years old a boy, and um, uh, you know I was uh, living in a village at that time, and uh, so it was. We were not prepared for that uh, because uh, Rwanda used to be, um, you know, our culture was uh, very close, like uh, your neighbors, like your friends, like. Uh, Pretty much like a part of your family, and um, and then all of a sudden we see genocide beginning to take place. Um, of course, you know the government was uh, then behind it, and uh, my tribe uh, being the tribe that was being uh, destroyed. So we are talking about um, you know your your neighbors, you know your friends that used to come and eat with you coming and, and uh, you know destroying your houses destroying everything you owned you know the properties everything uh, being destroyed and they also they want to kill you so um for me um, um my family uh, our dad and my uncle uh, they took our two families uh uh you know, to go and hide in the woods. And um, because the in Terahamwe, and let me explain what in Terahamwe is. In, in Terahamwe were the, uh, the military and, and non-military people who were trained to destroy uh, the Tutsi tribe. Now, uh, the Tutsi tribe was... Uh, um, you know, was uh, not on the power, uh, was uh, just pretty much the minority. So in Rwanda, we had the three tribes. One was the Twa, Hutu, and Tutsi. The Twa was the rest and were like, uh, you know, a very small percentage. And uh, the rest, the majority was the Hutu who were on the power. The Tutsi was not. And uh, but it used to be, you know, in the power a long, long time ago, uh, before the Rwanda received the independence. And um, but uh, now in the genocide, you know, the Hutus are destroying all the Tutsis, and uh, so Tutsi have to 
defend themselves, but they can't because they are not involved in military, they are not involved in politics, and so they have no way to defend themselves. And uh, the only thing they can do is to run to save their lives. And that's what my dad did and took our families in the bush, in the woods. We lived there uh, for, um, uh, for more than 10 days. Mm. And while we were there, uh, you know, uh, we had seen so many people being killed and, you know, our houses were destroyed. And uh, one morning, my dad and my uncle, they decided to take me with them uh, to go back, you know, look for something to give to our younger ones, you know, my siblings, because they were, you know, crying. And we had spent many days without food. And by the way, that's why I am raising money to go feed the family because I know what it means to be hungry, to be starving. And so uh, during that time, on our way going to look for something to give to my siblings, that's when we, my dad and my uncle, myself, we were captured by Interahamwe. Now, Interahamwe were crazy people. They had no mercy whatsoever. They killed you, they killed. These guys had raped, you know, uh, 500 plus women and, and, and you know, and, and, and girls, and they had uh, killed a lot of people. And you know that in genocide, more than, uh, uh, you know, more than, uh, 900,000 people lost their lives in 100 days. Mm. So to and, say, that, say that again, you know, because, uh, you know, we hear about the Holocaust and people know 6 million Jews died over the course of the entire World War II. Uh, others died, of course. But again, tell, tell how many people we think, you know, of course, they're discovering graves all the time and the numbers might go up. But about how many people died and, and what is the time period that that occurred in? So we are talking about uh, uh, the, the the actual number when it was uh, during the 1994, 1995, when they were still, uh, you know, counting all the numbers. It was uh, 900,000 people uh, that died in a, a period of uh, three months. And but after that, there have been uh, a lot of. Uh, bodies that were found so and that's why we are using 900 plus because there are many thousands uh you know many thousands that were found later that and even today every year when we go through genocide memorial we month there is always a new discovery of wow. dead like bodies 100 days that yes happened. now you know, in the Holocaust, when we studied the Jewish Holocaust, we know that Hitler used trains and the military and they used concentration camps. They used, uh, you know, showers with gas ovens. How were people being killed? You know, this group, the Inner Hamwe, this militia group kind of going. How did they kill people? Was it through similar ways or what was the way that most people were, were being killed? The, uh, the common way people were being uh, killed was uh, they were using uh, uh, machetes. Mm. Uh, so the, the every, almost every Rwandan uh, home owned machetes because that's what, even more than one, because that's what they used to, you know, to cut the woods. You know, we are talking about people that do not use electricity to cook. Uh, so they have to go... Uh, cut the firewoods and they use machetes to do that. And, uh, but uh, there was a, a large distribution of uh, machetes uh, within the country of Rwanda uh, because genocide, uh, we believe it was planned. So they, um, uh, they imported a lot of them and they distributed them to uh, the entire Hamwe. And uh, they used that very much. They used knives, and they used the uh, um, other, uh, you know, like uh, swords. Uh, they did use swords as well. They used uh, uh, pretty much local weapons because, uh, honestly speaking, there weren't many guns uh, except if you were in the military. The military people owned the guns, but uh, the local interhamwe did not have guns and even if they did it was like one gun for 
let's say five people, one gun for 10 people. And so, but they had all these uh, lock weapons that were using to uh, kill you and, 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 and destroy. And uh, what it was, you, I think you mentioned this earlier, you know, and again, another contrast between the, uh, another contrast between the uh, genocide uh, we studied about in World War II was that the people who were killing, the people doing this killing, these were people that knew the people that they were going to kill, right? These were like often neighbors or people you went to school with your whole life. Yes, that's right. Uh, um, so uh, because Rwanda is such a very small country and it has a lot of people, uh, life is uh, pretty much shared. Like, you know, if you live in a, in a neighborhood, you are likely to know everybody, you know, pretty much to know what they're going to eat for dinner, for lunch, because how life is shared all together. And, uh, and so in genocide, it was very easy to identify those who are Tutsi and those who are not, because, you know, if you had, you know, if you are surrounded by the Hutu uh, tribe and they were betraying you, so they, you know, they just will point to in Terahamwe, they tell in Terahamwe, hey, we know where the Tutsis are, here, here they are, you know, they tell you the, uh, the exact number of the house and those who had them and also the the exact look of you know they can just they just come and find you where you are then no way to hide you know a lot of times you know as americans we hear a little bit about tribal differences and i think it's kind of hard for us to kind of fully conceptualize what that's like you know uh, for us as americans we might be like well how would you you know like how would you even know you know like even when people talk about the Holocaust, like, well, how would you know there, there's a Jew or sometimes Jews in World War II would like try to like pass as a non-Jew and, and they could have some success. Like if there was this genocide based on hatred of the Tutsi, how did people know? You know, what is that even like to be a tribe? You know, uh, how, what, what, what is that even like? Yeah, it's, um, um, it, you, you know, it's one of the things that uh, when it started to happen, we, you know, we began to question like our parents because most of us didn't know our tribe until 1994. And because, you know, we didn't see the difference. Uh, but when 1994, you know, during the genocide, it, it's uh, uh, when people look at you and they will tell you, hey, you are Tutsi because you know, because maybe you look, uh, you know, they would say the Tutsi are more tall, you know, most of them are skinny, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and then the more they started sharing that, and you, that's how you would see the different, oh, the, you know, like the, most of Tutsis are going to be, you know, cattle keepers, you know, they're going to be, you know, behaving in this kind of way. And, uh, and then you begin to see the different. Uh, however, uh, there was so much of uh, um, uh, so much of uh, what is it uh, intermarriage, you know. Right. So there were so many Tutsis that had been married to Hutus, and you know, that, so there was intermarriage going on already. That uh, it was very, you know, even a uh, hard, and uh, and that's why there are a lot of. Uh, people who were not Tutsi who died, uh, you know, because the way they looked. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would be honest that a lot of people in genocide even tried to forge the, uh, you know, the ID cards because the, the Tutsi, uh, I mean, the, the, the government being so corrupt, they gave, they issued ID cards that uh, identified which uh, was your tribe. And uh, and so they gave the try. I mean, the ident identity cards and would indicate, hey, you are Tutsi, you are Hutu, you are Twa. And so there were so many roadblocks uh, all over the country. 
you are not, if you are going to the local market and uh, you have to go through on that road and they have to stop you, you have to show your ID card. And if it is said the Tutsi, then you are gone. You can't go any further. Wow. So that 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 was very easy for you know the entire family to identify you know even the Tutsi wherever they were. And it was very scary because you were like, why, you know, just someone to kill you and or to hurt you and something you did not choose to be a Hutu. You just born the way you were. You did not choose to be a Tutsi. You were born the way you were and just people to hurt you. It was very, um, uh, you know, a very uh, terrible uh, experience. Yeah. So there's government cards, identity cards, that if you were stopped, you would have to produce that and it could show right there what your tribal affiliation was. Yes. Now, I've heard that people mention that the radio was a big part of being used by Interhamwe to kind of get people, uh, encouraging people to round up their neighbors or the radio, some people would come on the radio you know, kind of telling people, oh, we need to get the Tootsies, they're, they're foreigners or they're bad influences. What do you, do you remember or know anything about that? Just the role of, of people getting on the radio and encouraging others to do these terrible things? Yes. Uh, so the radios uh, were very much used to, uh, um, you know, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, we only had one radio in, in the whole country. Uh -huh. And and this radio was a government radio. It didn't, you know, they were doing whatever the government was telling them. And anybody, whether you are in the military, you know, anybody can, you know, who had the power would go on the radio and they say, hey, let's go and destroy all the Tutsis wherever they are. And uh, you are speaking to the people all over the country. Like if you go to that radio, you have you know, uh, a platform to communicate to entire country and whatever you are saying, you know, people do it. They're very easy to go and they'll, you know, do it as long as it's coming from the radio that is belonging to the government. And so the, the radio was very much used and also the, uh, the newspapers, uh, there were newspapers that were used as well. And that was pretty much uh, the way people received the news. Uh, I mean, there were also other campaigns, you know, you know like uh, local campaigns. Uh, people gathered in the village and they would have these meetings. Uh, the meetings usually excluded the Tutsis. And uh, some good Hutus would come and uh, warn their friends, Tutsi, hey, you know, uh, the plan is there, we're going to kill you. And, uh, and, and so run away, run to save your life. And, um, yeah, so, mm -hmm. Were there examples? Like, you know, obviously, not all Tutsis were good people. Not all Hutus were bad people. There was people doing all kinds of stuff. But were there examples of Hutus who might not have wanted to go along with this and they themselves were killed for resisting or questioning or warning their Tutsi friends that Hutus died during this period as well? Yes, um, there are some uh, uh, good Hutus because uh, I think the worst mistake we can ever make is to, you know, say that all Hutus killed the Tutsi. I think that is not a fair statement. Mm. Uh, uh, there were uh, very good Hutus who actually hid the Tutsis, like in a ceiling, you know, others would hide them in, a, in the restrooms, and, you know, others were forced to uh you know like hey if you don't kill them we're gonna kill you and they decided to die with them wow and so there are these uh, good hutus and uh who were willing to risk their lives who are not you know a part of uh, the genocide right. but uh um uh and you know they decided to be on the side of uh, of tutsi even though they were not tutsi by tribe right mm -hmm. So at this time, how old were you when this started? 
Uh, when it started, I was uh, when it, it happened, I was uh, fourteen years old. Okay, fourteen. Yeah. Now, were you mm -hmm. living in Kigali, or were you in the villages? Where were you at at that time? I was uh, living in a village. Uh, okay. I didn't. I didn't move to Kigali Interior after genocide. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're in the village, and you guys, as your family, realize you have to get out. You go to the bush, which is like the woods, the forest, and in the bush, you guys are needing food there's no food for the little ones and you and your uncle you are sent out once you pick up your story uh you guys are looking for just the basics what happened to you yeah so when we when we went uh we left the village and my dad and my uncle we leave the village i mean we leave the the woods and uh, as we go we met the entire hamway and the entire hamway they uh, looked at us and they knew who we were. You know, it was very easy. They did not even ask us identity cards uh, because, you know, number one, we were very afraid of them and uh, they could see uh, the way we looked. And uh, so they uh, captured us and uh, they had all their weapons and uh, they grabbed uh, my uncle and uh, they killed him. And uh, they pretty much chopped his head off. And uh, um, as I was uh, watching, uh, because me and my dad, we were going to be the, um, you know, we're going to be killed as well. And, uh, but we can't run away because we're already, you know, in their hands and they are surrounding us. And, uh, but as I'm watching the dead body of my uncle and the blood is just, you know, all over. And uh, that time, knowing that I am going to die as a 14 years old boy, I thought, I, you know, I sensed that uh, all my dreams and everything that I had uh, dreamed before, I hoped for, you know, in this life had come to an end. But uh, I remember the story my mom had used to tell me when I was about six years old. She used to tell me that uh, there is uh, something and this thing is called God. And uh, if I ever find myself in uh, trouble and, you know, this thing can help me. And so the story was as if someone is whispering into my ears and is reminding me of that story. And uh, then I said, uh, within my heart, though, because my mouth would not say anything. I'm just, you know, uh, trembling. And, uh, um, but within my heart, I said, you think called God, if you are real, save me right now, like this moment. And if you save me, I am going to serve you forever. And uh, when I said that, um, it's uh, when uh, my dad and I saw the military uh, that was uh, fighting to stop a genocide, they came towards us. And one of them is uh, Captain Emmanuel. Uh, Captain Emmanuel came to us and he said, my name is Captain Emmanuel. I am here to rescue you. And he rescued me and my dad. Uh, but uh, his military, uh, they came and uh, when uh, they came and uh, the entire Hamway that were about to kill me and my dad, when they saw them coming, they ran away. And they ran away, they, you know, the military ran after them. And what happened later, we, you, you know, we don't know, but uh, Captain Emmanuel came towards us and he said, I'm, I'm here to rescue. He rescued me and my dad, took us to a safe place and, uh, uh, you know, near Burundi, uh, our neighboring country. We lived there for three months, and within those three months, we didn't have any sort of a communication with the, the rest of our family's members that we had left in the, in the woods. Uh, but uh, after that, we came back to our village, and we were able to meet my uh, siblings. You know, my sister didn't show up until almost uh, three years later because she ended up in Burundi. And uh, and then my brother came back uh, uh, almost a year later, and uh, but we were able to reunite and uh, you know and start life from uh, uh, it's like he 
you know, uh, start a button. We just start life. I mean, we started life afresh. Wow. Mm. And so back at that time, there was no Facebook or easy internet like we have today. So uh, how many years was your sister gone that you had not heard from her? So my sister was gone uh, for three years, uh, almost um, it, it, because she left in 1994 and she didn't come until towards the end of 1997. Wow. And uh, so, and the, again, there was no communication. You know, we, we didn't have cell phones at that time. Right. Uh, we did not, we, we had house phones, but those were owned by like, uh, you gotta be rich. To have that phone, yeah, and uh, you know, no Facebook, of course, and no, uh, no text, and the mail system also. Uh, you can't mail, you know, it wasn't genocide, and even like my sister, there was no, no way to mail them because number we didn't know where she was, and right. um, so it was a, uh, um, it was a, a, a miracle for us to see her again. Wow. So did, did mm-hmm. you think that she was she had been killed during genocide? That uh, that's what every one of us thought. Um, but uh, I would be honest that uh, when uh, when I got you know when I gave my life to Jesus and uh, I began to pray, God told me that she was still alive, and I told my parents they would not believe that, uh, and <laughs> until you know she showed up, you know, almost three years and. And uh, I was like, yeah, I knew she was alive, but I didn't know where she was. But uh, uh, so most, you know, of our family members, they just, they thought, you know, she had been killed and we were very uh, sorry that we didn't get to bury her. And, uh, but uh, God protected her. Wow. And mm-hmm. so she ended up being in another country. She went to Burundi. Yes. Wow. Now, uh, Burundi and Rwanda are very similar. There's also Hutus and Tutsis there, right? Yes. Uh, was there also killing uh, in, in, in Burundi between with those tribal issues, or was that like a place that was much safer that people could flee? Uh, it was a, a place that was much safer. Um, she, um, what happened is she um, followed the crowd during the genocide, and then uh, she ended up uh, being, uh, um, you know, a family uh, took her in. And this family was a Burundian family. And they took her in and she was pretty much like a part of their family. And, um, and they kind of protected her because she was a foreigner, uh, you know, in the Burundi. Uh, but now that she was living in a Burundi family, they kind of protected her. They took her in as if uh, it was uh, their own daughter. And uh, um, and so she was safe. And um, uh, they were also in a place that was much safer. Right. Mm-hmm. So after genocide, you know, there's, a, there's a, a war in Rwanda and a new government takes over and kind of brings all the killing to an end. And... Uh, how do people in Rwanda move forward? Like, how do you move past or move through the horrors of genocide? Uh, what are some of the most effective ways that people in Rwanda are able to live in a society where you don't, you're not governed by constant hatred? Because, I mean, you know the people who killed aunts and uncles, or, or you know the people, like, how, how do people not let that hold them down with hatred and and continue cycles of violence or say, well, you killed my uncle, so now it's our turn. What are some of the ways that Rwanda is able to get through something like that? Yeah, so uh, what happened was uh, um, uh, we had uh, the government emphasizing on forgiveness. Uh, You know, like we have to live together. You know, of course, those who did participate in the genocide, they were brought to, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they went to the judge. And, uh, you know, I would say that uh, uh, almost all of them 
you know, except those who ran, uh, you know, outside the country, but uh, the, almost everyone else was, you know, uh, they, they were brought in front of justice. And, uh, and, 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 you know, we had uh, what we call the gachacha. Gachacha was uh, more of a, uh, a local court, uh, uh, you know, think about uh, the people who are, um, known it to be the people with the integrity and uh, in a village and this had to do nothing with any sort of religion but the people who knew in a village in a, in a village to be or you know to be honest person and so they did appoint those people in a village and they would sit down and sort the matter of what exactly happened and they would bring even those who are in jail the, you know, they bring them and they will be interviewed and the people who saw them do whatever they did, uh, you know, maybe they killed and, and, you know, and or maybe they've been saying, oh, I've been uh, sent, you know, I've been in uh, Niger and I did nothing. Now they bring it to that very place where, you know, uh, you are likely to have uh, done the genocide in that very village and they will interview you and you will have to explain and you will have you know local witness or people will say no that person is innocent he hid me he was a good person right. and so uh there was much of a transparency and also uh the government was emphasizing here hey, we have to move on you know we cannot allow the the past to control our future we have to move on forgive so we can continue to live together we did have uh, the government uh, teach us that and also the non-profit also did come in they did a, a very wonderful job you know they would uh, teach the importance of uh, you know forgiveness mm. and um uh, for, for me uh you know being a, a, a you know, you know, when I gave my life to Jesus, I understood that even me, I am a sinner, even though I was a Tutsi, I'm a Tutsi, but still I'm a sinner and I needed to forgive someone else who killed my uncle in order to, you know, uh, not only to be free, but also to demonstrate what, what you know, God did for me. So, um, transparency was uh one of the things that it really helped us and also uh hey let's not uh, let us not be held by the history you know it's the history it's something that has happened but we cannot allow that to uh you know uh pretty much control our future we have to embrace the new future a new rwanda we forgive one another and we leave us in rwanda and, and also um we the government stopped um like in rwanda we no longer identify ourselves as tutsi and hutu you know can you know we just we promote uh one uh you know uh, I, I won't say one tribe but we say we, we celebrate the uniqueness of Rwanda, you know, we may be different. Uh, we may be some may be a Tutsi, another one from Hutu background. But uh, uh, what matters the most is that we are all Rwandans, other than being held by these uh, divisions. But we are all one Rwandans. Wow, that's mm -hmm. cool. Uh, for you, you know, I know a lot of people, you know, had to actually deal with, you know interacting with their neighbors that had betrayed them or people coming up and saying, hey, you know, I was responsible for this crime or the other. Did you have any personal experiences meeting people that confessed to you that that they were responsible, that they had done these things? Did you have any experiences like that? Yeah. Um, so um, uh, uh, after genocide, um, you know, and after I gave my life to Jesus, I was uh, involved in a, a prison ministry. And uh, as a, so I was a pastor and I'm pastoring the church, but I'm also going to, so I'm going to prison to uh, teach uh, reconciliation, uh, in, in, you know, in the prison. And 
but we were teaching reconciliation based on uh, Bible uh, principles. And uh, when I was there, one I remember one uh, uh, one time I was uh, after I preached and I shared my story of how you know God rescued my life uh, in genocide. And then there was a guy um, who came to me and he said, young boy, you know, young man, I can relate to your story. I'm like, what do you mean? He's, uh, and he's like, I think I killed your uncle. And, uh, you know, I taught him, you know, uh, I forgive you. And, you know, that was my first word to tell him because I wanted him to know I forgave him. And uh, and I would tell you that there are many stories, you know, like that, where people have uh, come and confessed that uh, they killed so and so. And, uh, you know, the best way to do uh, is to forgive and to let them know that, uh, you know, uh, you are not, uh, you know, you are not uh, wishing that, uh, they were killed as well because that's what forgiveness means you want them to know they are forgiven and uh and that uh, we can start a new life that's incredible i, I think so many people would hear that and, and knowing that you saw your uncle killed in front of you and years later in a prison a man comes up to you and says man those details of the story i i, rem- I can identify because i was on the other side of that story I guess some people would ask, you know, how how do you forgive? Like knowing, you know, in our heads, we know, yeah, that's important. We know we should do that. But like on a personal level, Peter, like how were those words able to come out of your mouth? I forgive you. You know, like what what empowers you to to be like that? You know, uh, I would uh, be honest that uh, uh, years after genocide, I lived uh you know with the bitterness i wished uh, bad things would happen to anybody uh you know all people who participated in the genocide i wish the bad things would happen i wished i would do you know do something and um i think i think if i you know had the power i would have done something bad but uh, uh god uh showed me that i was the bad person i was not good and god forgave me and so when uh, but i struggled with it uh when i went to jail and i met this person uh i had already forgiven him like years before and uh like i had been freed uh from bitterness and uh, I think uh, your question, how, what empowers me to do that, I would say that uh, it is the forgiveness that I have received from God himself. Because, uh, you know, the Bible, uh, you know, pretty much says that uh, we were sinners and Christ died for us. So I was not a, a good person when god forgave me uh but god freely forgave me and as his follower uh the least i can do is to forgive other people uh to show them that uh you know the forgiveness i received is real i'm not you know it's not a hypocrite I, it's real and i have to forgive them and i would say that uh, it is because of the forgiveness that I received that empowers me, uh, you know, to understand the weight of forgiving and the need of forgiving others as well. Wow. You know, I think in that way, Rwanda can serve as a powerful teacher. You know, like uh, sometimes we look at the story of Rwanda 26 years ago and the story of hatred and cruelty is what we we hear, we remember, but there's another story. The other side of that coin is a story of forgiveness, a story of reconciliation, a story that a country that was once divided can uh, not be held hostage by feelings of hatred and bitterness and tribalism, but but they can move forward. And so 
you know, I just wanted to, you know, even have that opportunity for you to come and share, uh, especially as we remember in April what happened 26 years ago that there is forgiveness happening today. There is reconciliation happening today that, you know, Rwanda, you know, 26 years ago, you would not have thought, okay, well, this country is going to be a country that's going to be a leader. But actually, it really is in many ways in, in Africa. It's developing. Uh, it is growing. It's not without its challenges, but uh, I think Rwanda can be a great example for all of us uh, of the power of forgiveness, the power of moving forward and not being held by the things that have happened to us in our past. Yes, yeah, we uh, we are, uh, um, you know, we fear the, uh, the challenges that uh, we have faced and, you know, um, they have, uh, um, that we have learned a lot of lessons and uh, a nation uh, can be destroyed, you know, by hatred, you know, hatred can do, a, a, you know, such a, a big damage, a big distraction. And, uh, but also forgiveness can build a community and we can be one people again. And uh, I am, you know, I'm proud of uh, uh, of my country. I'm proud of, uh, you know, being in Rwanda. Uh, you know, after genocide, I wasn't uh, because I, I felt like, you know, why in the world was I born in Rwanda? But when you see the progress and when you see what has happened today and and now, where I mean, where we are today, uh, 26 years later, and uh, Tutsi and Hutu and Twa, the you know, uh, they live in the same village, they drive the same, uh, y y you know, they ride in the same uh, bus and uh, they're not fighting and, you know, they are in the same church and, you know, and uh, we just see that uh, it's been a long journey, but uh, uh, we are so thankful for where we are. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, Peter, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's really good to hear from you and hear that story of uh, forgiveness, uh, amazing. Uh, I guess I forgot to ask one question. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned that, you know, as you guys were being uh, about to be taken, uh, this, this, these military people led by Captain Emmanuel came in. Were you able, ever able to find out who that officer was or, or look into that? No. Uh, so, um... I would, uh, I think, because um, uh, after genocide, we tried, uh, we tried to look for Emmanuel. The one and, who saved you guys. Yeah, the one who saved us, and we couldn't find him. And uh, so we think uh, that it was an angel of God. Um, uh, I mean, when I got saved, I knew that Emmanuel means God with us. And uh, uh, and who could possibly come and rescue me after I prayed that I would give my life the rest, you know, I would give my life to God the rest of, you know, the years. I think Emmanuel was God sent God's messenger to rescue me and my dad. And uh, that's why we couldn't even trust him. And, uh, and so I you know, uh, thank uh, God that he did that. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Amazing story. Well, thank you again so much, Peter. I'm so glad we could spend a little bit of time together. I look forward after quarantine where we could actually see each other face to face. Yes. And uh, we hope that that will be soon. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Peter. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Okay. Bye. Bye.